what we call a little bit of a mental model approach. We call it channelization, characterization, prioritization, and execution. Um, so let me start off with a little bit of what we mean by channelization. Most people would, you know, we this is what we refer to as our stack, right down from the bottom, from facilities going all the way to your applications. Um, nothing really surprising here. The majority of the focus whenever we're trying to optimize or secure anything tends to just be on the parts. So we can say, you know what, I've patched my network, I've patched my compute and storage, and my applications in OS. I must be secure. Well, I'm great. Well, our, we'd argue, and in our experience, um, process is also very important, as are the people. And you really have to have all of these three working together in sync, and what we like to refer to here as the 3P model, um, to be able to really make all of them work together securely and productively. And there are certain activities that you perform on people, process, and parts. We refer to them as kind of the four M's over here, kind of going back to the little memes and themes that are easy to memorize. And this is effectively our stack approach to channelization. So we say you can manage, monitor, migrate, or modify any of these things within here. You can modify your people, your processes, or your parts, et cetera. So <clears throat> it's out of no kind of coincidence we put in a bunch of numbers there because these all add up to at least 60 possibilities. The reason I brought this up is I think it's it's important to realize that it's not, you know, it goes back to that, that theme originally that we had talked about. It's not sufficient to just put in the firewall because you're probably only looking at one layer it, uh, of the network and you're only looking at a part and you're looking at maybe managing it um, at best and maintaining it. But that's not that's only maybe one of the 60 possibilities that are out there. But Worse yet, if you take the network and you kind of break that down, you're looking at um, you know, your metro networks, your LAN, as well as your WAN, and they themselves have different kind of solutions in there. So there's a lot of things that can be done, and you're probably asking yourselves, great, you've su you know, successfully kind of overwhelmed me and told me how many possibilities there are, <clears throat> which is a lot. It's at least 180 times whatever you'd put in there. Where do I start? Uh, well, we think ISO 27001 and the standards related to 27K are a great start. Uh, it advocates kind of the, the pillars of the security model, um, at least that, as we've posed them. But we should also be in a position to characterize this before we kind of get to prioritization. So here's a here's another mental model that I personally like to use, and this is something that I, I picked up from uh, uh, you know both the SANS and the NIST framework, is the, we call the four quadrant model. And you characterize a risk in terms of either whether it's intentional or accidental or external or internal. I think a lot of us would guess that the majority of breaches and causes for break-ins and um, uh, kind of hacks happen in the intentional external quadrant. Well, it turns out that's actually not the case. Overall, it turns out internal accidental, um, if you wonder who makes the accident, it turns out to be either human beings or it's a lack, you know, for example, a lack of communication, something gets misconfigured. Not so much someone tripping over a cable, but it's oftentimes we chalk it up to a lack of communication or completion or thoroughness of a project. For example, segmenting a network horizontally is not fully completed or it's not maintained or someone forgot about it. That actually accounts for 38% of the characterizations of <clears throat> the breaches that we see. So a way to think about risk, and we line them up around two axes here, the probability of an event occurring and times its impact. And I think a lot of the folks who are attending here today are kind of familiar with this little two-axis model. But where do you start? Let's start with the things that are the most probable and going to give you the biggest risk. And then you eventually work your way down to the things that are least probable and have the least risk. So you kind of navigate your way a little bit of a zigzag pattern there. If you kind of combine it with the ability to figure out what your channels are, what the parts, processes, people are, uh, understand how to characterize them, you can fill in this matrix and now you have at least a priority uh, in which to start executing because you know, having a plan is certainly important, but uh, being organized allows you to be able to execute on small victories and get to uh, your objective at the end of the day. The, the mountain will not seem as overwhelming as if you have a plan that can be broken down into digestible chunks. So at least those first three steps are what I'd certainly advocate uh, in terms of an organizational framework to start breaking up a, a seemingly very, very large task um, into smaller digestible chunks that you can at least demonstrate success. So in terms of the execution, 
um, you know, we're certainly proponents of the NIST framework, and uh, you know, in terms of identify, protect, detect, respond, and uh, recover, and there are a whole bunch of activities that are associated with uh, each of these phases here. I won't read these all out, but again, this makes it digestible, and each of these is kind of backed by certifications and compliance like SOC 1, SOC 2, uh, PIPEDA, HIPAA. You can end up gaining a lot of compliance if you start implementing uh, things in a kind of an organized fashion this way. Again, you can only respond to those things that you can kind of detect and in turn, you know, kind of identify to begin with. It's kind of hard to recover from something uh, if you don't know what you're responding to. So again, following kind of an ordered approach that way really allows you to set some priorities and start executing and, and having putting some victories under your belt. So again, the advantages of having a managed security partner, uh, again, not so much on a shameless plug, but, uh, you know, we've done this for a living. We've helped out some you know, pretty, companies large and small, whether they're from oil or gas or to energy, uh, logistics and transportation, and through the healthcare, we even have government clients, and we've written their playbooks on how to respond to these uh, types of events. Um, and that being said, there are you know, a few key takeaways here that I would leave you with. Having focused expertise uh, is really important because you want to focus on what you do best. And having proactive solutions is going to be one of the important things to have rather than just only purely responsive to say, okay, you know what, something has happened, let me restore from a backup. So that's my uh, kind of portion of that. I'm going to turn it over. And